Hello! As requested, I'm going to try out a voiceover video. About one and a half years ago, Stratton Blitz made a video where he went to Mars and back with a fully reusable spacecraft. Then, he made another video like it, but where he went to all five of Jules' moons instead. Both are some of my favorite KSP videos ever, and I highly suggest that you watch them. Both of these videos inspire me, so I combined the two and here's what I've come up with. In this video, I will land Jebediah Kerman on the four Galilean moons of Jupiter, and return him, and everything I launched, back to Earth. In descending order of distance from Jupiter, I will land on Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. Please note that I used Smurf for this task, as the challenge of doing this with stock parts was way too daunting, and I would be very surprised and very impressed if someone pulled it off. To complete this mission, I used copious tweak scaling to put together a 690 part 115 kiloton rocket, which was as wide as the entire runway, 70 meters. As such, launching it from the runway was the only option, as it would destroy both itself and the launch pad if it were secured by launch clamps. The first stage comprises 21 mammoth engines, all at different sizes, and 4 vector engines rescaled to 2.5 meters to help control the entire thing. This provides 1.5 giganewtons of thrust around 45 Saturn V's. This stage also contains over 99% of all the fuel and all the electric charge we'll use, mostly thanks to the enormous 20 meters batteries, which are there to power the 20 meter reaction wheels that are directly underneath them. The first stage gets us all the way up to a suborbital trajectory at a speed of 4.2 km per second and is ditched at an altitude of 107 km. Once detached, I use the flight manager for reusable stages mod to take control of it and land it safely in the ocean. Since the stage is re-entering from a relatively steep suborbital trajectory, there were some worries that it might just impact the water without slowing down at all. Luckily, since it's almost entirely empty on fuel, it provides an absurd amount of lift and can even maintain level flight at around 20 km while decelerating. The stages slow down with 20 radial joke shoots rescaled to 400%, followed by 8 radial parachutes also rescaled to 400% with some help from the engines. Once the stage splashes down, I instantly take control of the main rocket again to continue its mission. The second stage is powered by a Rhino engine rescaled to 14.2 meters, riding a total of 3 kilometers of delta V and 83 mega newtons of thrust, which will push us all the way to a speed of 6.9 kilometers per second at an altitude of 181 kilometers. Re-entry for this stage was fairly tricky, as it constantly wanted to flip prograde despite my best attempts to keep it from doing so. Fortunately, nothing melted off and the parachutes could not only slow it down, but also get it oriented into the right direction with nothing breaking off. Landing off the stage mirrors the previous one, with the engine slightly helping to softly land it in the ocean. The final stage, comprising four vector engines scaled up to 2.5 meters, successfully brings us into stable, low Earth orbit. Once in orbit, we detach the fairing and the third stage and get ready to our transfer, which will be towards Venus. This transfer is going to be performed by the nuclear module, which comprises four nuclear engines and has a total of 6 km per second of delta V. While this is enough to transfer all the way to Jupiter, since I have to return this module to Earth, I'm instead going to do gravity assists off of Venus and the Earth, and I'll ditch um, the nuclear module on one of the Earth assists. This transfer will be split into multiple 5 minutes burns at periapsis before the final ejection. This is relatively inefficient, but since we packed a lot of extra little TV, that's not a problem. The gravity assist off of Venus is tuned to put our orbit onto an intersection with the Earth, where we get another gravity assist after a few orbits. However, at this point, we get into a problem. This gravity assist will put our periapsis to be the same as the Earth's, meaning that we can't get any more orbital energy by doing assists off of the Earth. We can either get assists off of Mars to go further, or do a maneuver in deep space to change our periapsis, which will allow us to do another gravity assist. I chose to do the second, performing a 198 meter per second burn to lower our periapsis, which will then raise our projected apoapsis after the assist. The reason why this is to my benefit is that lowering the periapsis in this way is cheaper than just raising the apoapsis to that altitude by a significant margin, and at this point I was already getting a little worried about my delta V budget. Originally, I only wanted to do two assists off of the Earth, but that has proved not to be enough, so after another deep space maneuver, we were approaching the Earth for a third time. At this point, we really have to think about how we're going to approach Jupiter. We need to encounter Jupiter at our apoapsis rather than at other points in our orbit, as that is going to significantly lower our capture burn. From there, the nuclear module is going to alter its orbit to intersect the atmosphere, while the main ship, now powered by ion engines, will continue on towards Jupiter. Re-entering with the nuclear module proved to be a bit of a challenge. The module was unstable and wanted to flip around, and any deviation from prograde would instantly make it do so. The solution was to let Smart ASS control the direction of the craft with constant use of RCS for adjustment. The temperatures did get quite high, but nothing broke.
the aero braking pass proved to be too weak to actually capture us into orbit, requiring a pretty sizable engine burn. A lot of time and a few course corrections later, the ion module is arriving at Jupiter. Since Jupiter's atmosphere is very painful to aero break through, I'm going to use my 18 ion engines to slow down into a capture orbit. To maximize the orbit effect, I put my periapsis as close to the atmosphere as I dared, but even with all these preparations, the capture burn proved to be too much to do with a single charge of batteries. So I performed one part of a burn before periapsis, and the other one after periapsis after I let the RTGs recharge a little. With the capture complete, it was time to get into orbit of one of the moons. I chose Callisto for this, because when I'll eject from Callisto on my return to Earth, I'll already have a lot of gravitational potential energy relative to Jupiter, which will lower my ejection burn. Uh, this, I want to point out, however, that this was unnecessary, as I have tremendously over-budgeted this mission to absolutely ensure that I don't run out of fuel. After a lot of burns, I was able to get an encounter of Callisto with a low enough relative velocity, such that the capture can be done on a single charge of the batteries. Once in elliptical Callisto orbit, I detached the lander module and the ion tug and pushed it into low Callisto orbit. The ion tug comprises four ion engines with a total of 8 km per second of delta V, which is enough to transfer from Callisto to Io and back. After the tug pushed us into low orbit, we detach the lander and get ready. Despite having a reaction wheel, I only use that when absolutely necessary, and as such, most of the steering is going to come from the spider engine's gimbal. Landing here is going to mirror landing on Tylo or other high radius bodies. I want to keep myself as close to the surface as possible to cancel out any horizontal speed, while hopefully not gaining too much vertical speed, which is delta V loss to gravity. Once landed, the ship will plant a flag and then rendezvous back with the main ship. At this point, I realized that I used the wrong flag instead of the one that I wanted to use. After this landing, I did some cheeky safe file hacking to equip my Kerbal with the correct flag, however, for no other purpose. For launching, we need to be careful about getting into the correct plane. Orbital speeds around Callisto are about 1.7 km per second, and even a small difference in inclination can be quite expensive to correct for. Takeoff is generally similar to landing, where I pick up as much horizontal speed as possible and at the same time gaining height. After getting back to the ion tug, I went for a rendezvous back with the main ship, where I refueled my craft and got it ready for its second landing, which would be on the largest moon in the solar system, Ganymede. The capture at Ganymede proved to be too large to perform with a single charge of batteries. So at first, I did as much as I could, and then waited a few orbits for another rendezvous where I'd finish the job. The landing on Ganymede was a little problematic, since I wasted quite a lot of fuel on it. This will make the takeoff very interesting, but now, Jeb is going to plant the second flag of our mission, which is the correct one this time. On the ascent, I cut it extremely close, entering orbit with only 176 meters per second of delta V remaining. The rendezvous took quite some time, but I did manage to get it done, even with just a sliver of fuel left in the tanks. There's not really much to talk about in the transfer to Callisto, but the rendezvous is quite interesting. Normally, I'd make sure that both my inclination and my longitude of periapsis are the same as the main craft. However, because we have lots of extra fuel, that's not an issue. I can just go into a very high orbit and then change my longitude of periapsis with a simple retrograde burn. It's less efficient, but I don't really care. Our next transfer will be to Europa, but we'll first get there with a Ganymede assist to save fuel. Because we have so much fuel remaining, that's not necessary. To capture at Europa was too large to do a single battery charge, so I had to perform the rest closer to the edge of Europa's sphere of influence. After capturing, we're going to land and plan our third flag. Ascent and rendezvous mirror what we did on Ganymede, where we launch into the target's plane to go for a close approach. Luckily, we had more than enough fuel this time. From here, we transfer to Callisto, once again with the help of a Ganymede assist. Send our stuff from there, dock, refuel, and get ready. The transfer to Io is going to be with numerous gravity assists, as that is the only place where I'm concerned about my delta V. Even with all these assists, our relative velocity with Io is too much to do the capture at once with a single charge of the batteries. So instead, I burn as much as I can at periapsis, and then set up another encounter further down the line so I can finish it up. Landing on Io also proved to be interesting, as I had neglected to recharge the batteries before undocking, which meant that we didn't have a lot of electric charge. After planning the final flag, Jeb will climb back aboard the lander and wait. Not much to say about the takeoff and rendezvous, so let's speed this up. When transferring back to Callisto, I realized that my worries about my Delta V budget were unfounded, so my journey back was pretty inefficient. With everything docked back up, it's time to go home. First, we eject from Callisto and slowly move into a higher and higher orbit of Jupiter. This took a very long time. After that, we do two very large burns to go on a trajectory that intersects with Earth. One in the Jovian system to eject, and another in deep space to lower our periapsis further. 
Then, we aerobrake to get into elliptical Earth orbit, reconfigure our heat shields, and break down into low orbit. The nuclear tug, which has been in space for 90 years at this point, is going to do the same, and the two will proceed to rendezvous with each other. After docking everything up, we get to the third stage of our rocket and dock that up. From there, it's just the fairing remaining, which needs to be carefully aligned. With the craft re-entering, let's take stock of the mission. The mission started in 1951 and ended in 2095, taking 144 years. In the end, we only used around half of all the xenon that he had available, which goes to show how much this could be improved with better flying and more efficiency. Thank you all for watching. Feel free to give me suggestions or feedback in the comments, and I hope to see you next time.